Hello, everybody. Um, we're just letting everybody into the room. So give us a couple of seconds and we'll kick off. But thank you so much for joining us. little tickers still going up so I'm going to just hold on for a couple more <laughs> this is an awkward silence at the beginning of an event <laughs> right I think we should get going so uh, hello everybody um, I'm Anna Taylor the uh, executive director at the Food Foundation and really really delighted to have um, Dolly Tice here with us. Um, Dolly is a visiting researcher at the University of Cambridge and also a policy consultant. And Dolly, you were really the one who inspired a whole lot of us to get organised for party conferences. Um, I think you were, you know, encouraging all the organisations in the sort of public health and food space to really start to get our voices heard in the political kind of conversation, more political conversations. And we've now had two weeks of, we've had Labour Party conference in Liverpool and we've had Tory Party conference in Birmingham. And we thought we would use this moment to reflect a little bit on the conversations that we've had and the events that we held and what we've gleaned from all of that about where food is in the wider political context. So thanks so much, Dolly, for joining us. Let's, we're going to take it in three big themes. We're going to start with the obesity theme. Then we're going to move on to the sort of free school meals and cost of living kind of theme. And then we're going to move on and touch a little bit on the farming and environment stuff. We spent less time on that. So that'll be a bit, a little bit, bit less comprehensive, I think, but thought it's important to still include it. So let's start, Dolly. Um, Let's start with the Prime Minister. What did we learn from Tory party conference about um, where Liz Truss is and all of this stuff and any other broader reflections that you want to make about what we were trying to achieve at party conferences? Yeah, well, thank you so much for, for having me. And um, yeah, it's great to have a debrief after <laughs> two weeks of very full on activity in this area. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if it's helpful to give a bit of context of why there was, you know, I kind of had this absolute desire to make sure that there was activity at party conference this year. Um, but last year, um, I just couldn't believe that there was not one event on sort of food, healthy eating agenda. It's quite hard um, to capture it, but it's not just sort of health events. Um, um, I think there were a couple on the NHS, but really looking at that public health and particularly around diets, um, uh, set, no, nothing at the Conservative Party conference last year. And I wasn't I, I can't remember if there was anything at Labour, but it was just brilliant that if, you know, if there's been one big change this year. It, it was the sheer number of events that took place uh, across both. So that was partly because, you know, this this big effort, but a lot of the organisations getting behind it, but also because it's just so topical. We've had a year of, you know, two prime ministers um, threatening to scrap policies in this area and already making decisions that have, have delayed certain policies that were due in. So we had that under Boris Johnson, then Liz Truss became prime minister and she made it incredibly clear, including at the Conservative Party conference, that her position on this was adverse to the entire agenda. And she even, if anyone watched her speech right at the end, she said, I'm not interested in how many two for one offers you buy at the supermarket, how you spend your spare time or in virtue signaling. And what she was referring to with those two for one offers um, is obviously the legislation to uh, restrict unhealthy buy one, get one free um, uh, offers in supermarkets. And that um, is yet to come into place. We had the legislation passed on location promotions um, that luckily came in. And I think that was partly because it was it came in before they could really rally themselves to do anything. So she's making herself very clearly uh, someone who is against these kind of policies and because she talks about freedom 
I was kind of really, really interested in what she means by freedom. Um, and, and I'd love to sort of explore that particular theme, but she's very much against this agenda and shows that she doesn't really understand how the actual policies work. Great, yes, so that's, well, not great, of course, but that's, that's setting out the scene really well. Um, we didn't hear a huge amount from Therese Coffey, I don't think, at the, uh, who's obviously Secretary of State for Health, um, at the Tory party conference, though I believe she did make some comments about, you know, wanting to look at the evidence further, but didn't really sort of set out her stool on this, did she? Um, what about also Caroline Johnson? I think you were in an event with Caroline Johnson, who's the public health minister. What have we learned about her position on these issues? Yeah, I mean, there was uh, there was nothing from from Therese Coffey, although Michael Gove, when he um, did the I was on a panel with him for an IPPR event on health and he spoke about having worked with Therese Coffey and said it is very much in line with the way that she approaches things to kind of not rush into the decision making. And given her science background, she uh, has a Ph.D., um, uh, in science and has has sort of applied that scientific approach to her policy making uh, as it seems. So Michael Gove was very much talking about the fact that it wasn't a surprise that she sort of, you know, uh, I, there were kind of worries that uh, when the media covered the kind of scrapping, potential scrapping of the um, health disparities white paper that had been developed under, under Sajid Javid. And he was sort of saying, I don't think it's scrapping as such, you know, we're, we're gonna see what's actually going to happen, what she's going to do on it, but she's very much someone who takes her time, but she hasn't said anything about her position when it comes to the kind of healthy eating agenda, healthy food agenda. Um, Dr. Caroline Johnson, who's the new public health minister, um, I sat on a panel with her and, and she said at the beginning it was her first event, uh, you know, in that position talking about this agenda. Um, and she said, she, you know, she is completely committed to this agenda. She talked about her own experience as a clinician, seeing the impact of poor diets um, on people, particularly talking about children. She talked about children a lot, emphasizing that the intervention from government absolutely needs to start early during childhood. Um, and she really made a big point about being someone who is interested in acting. So I gave a kind of background about uh, my research that had shown, you know, we've had sort of almost 700 obesity policies in England over the last 30 years, and yet no reduction in the prevalence of obesity and related inequalities. And she came back to that um, when I was talking about the fact that so few get implemented and um, or they get scrapped. And she said she's absolutely someone who wants to focus on acting and not just publishing new strategies for this for the sake of it. So it will be really interesting seeing how she actually goes about that. And we also know that public health ministers can have a pretty tough time when it comes to influence, influencing this agenda, especially if you're up against a number 10. Mm. absolutely against it so it's going to be very interesting seeing how she comes out or whether she stays sort of behind the scenes and tries to do this uh more discreetly mm, interesting and for those of you that are, are listening um in the chat isabel is paste, pasting the links to some of these events that we're referring to because if you want to go and hear it from the horse's mouth you can go and listen to some of those recordings and and find out what was said um, so we can now jump to Labour on this very same issue, where, of course, we had an intervention from Wes Streeting, um, the shadow health minister, who um, I think was rather disappointing in his comments in the sense that he, in spite of the fact the Labour Party has historically, and particularly under Andrew Glynn as public health shadow minister, has been really strong on a lot of these issues. Where Streeting sort of took a bit of a position which was, mm, I'm with the government on this one. Um, and I think overall, a lot of us were really disappointed with that positioning. What do you agree with that, Dolly? Yeah, I was really, I sort of went back to check <laughs> my interpretation of it, you know, because I, I sort of watched it all live on the news and, and when it was coming out, kind of reading it. And I was just so surprised at his kind of adverse position, particularly to the, again, the two for one offers. Um, uh, and I'll talk, um, but I did check and he absolutely was saying he was committed to the um, agenda and said, you know, he kind of gave a message to government to say, do not scrap any of it. It would be terrible to do so. And sort of made the political point that a lot of the policies had been sort of developed under Labour. So it sounds 
sounds like he absolutely is committed to the agenda he about uh, being supportive of, of the soft drinks industry level measures so he sort of it signaled the fact that he wouldn't be interested in applying um more tax i'm sorry if my internet is going a bit dodgy i'll try and uh, slow down um but what he, what he said in particular about the two-for-one offers on unhealthy food is that it was tin-eared to crack down on these on these buy one get one freeze during the cost of living crisis so he sort of when you know the food the price of food is going up and that was very frustrating because it's either that he's trying to make the political point to people that he doesn't want to be seen as intervening because often the perception with government intervention on food is that it will make food more expensive, which is sort of fundamentally incorrect in a lot of cases. Um, and particularly with this um, uh, intervention, because unhealthy buy one, get one freeze, as the research shows, encourages people to spend more and consume more. So it's not actually helpful when it comes to the cost of living crisis and we're talking specifically about an intervention targeting unhealthy food so when he's sort of using weaponizing that perception um either he's doing it for political reasons or he doesn't actually understand how the policy works which is i don't know which one's more um more worrying or it's a combination of both um so i think this just shows that even potentially the perception is that labor would be more amenable to these types of policies and actually the proof is that they are very hard for politicians to either understand and or marry up with the political communication yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're absolutely right. And then we had the, um, I mean, on that sort of broader theme of all well, the politics around the issue, we, of course, we had um, Jacob, Jacob Rees-Mogg's pre the chocolate orange comment, <laughs> of course, relating to stuff on checkout and a rather lovely tweet from Bite Back where they filmed somebody taking actual oranges and placing them at the checkout point <laughs> where the sweets go in a supermarket to liberate the real orange rather than the chocolate orange. It's anyway. so funny though, because when, <laughs> I mean, I, I, if anyone didn't see this, basically Jacob Rees-Mogg was in a, a conversation with the Institute for Economic Affairs, which is a very kind of libertarian, generally against uh, interventions related to this agenda. And he was in conversation with the head of it and basically said, may I encourage people as a passive protest to move the chocolate oranges to the checkout counter. <laughs> and it was freedom for chocolate oranges. <laughs> and it's so funny that they've become symbolic of this kind of agenda because David Cameron, if anyone knows their sort of history around this agenda, will remember that David Cameron in 2006 or seven, it was so early, I think it was six, um, talked about he was still reconciling his own position on this, but said fundamentally that why should why should places like WH Smith's put chocolate oranges at checkouts when they could put real oranges and he actually used that exact um, food type <laughs> to make the opposite case when he was getting his head around it so I thought it was very funny that we're still talking about chocolate oranges and <laughs> whether they should be real oranges or not that's so interesting I had completely forgotten about the David Cameron comment that's that's really interesting um what about good things on this agenda? So I took quite a positive view of some of the comments that Richard Walker, Iceland's CEO, made um, at one of the fringe events that we hosted, where he was reticent about some of the location-based promotions, wasn't convinced that it would actually uh, help people to purchase a bit less H you know, high fat sugar and salt foods. Uh, actually fe felt that things like the sugar and salt tax or at least the sugary drinks industry levy proposed or in some kind of version of expansion of that would actually be a simpler way and in a better way of re-incentivizing the system. I thought that was quite a positive remark from him. Yeah, I'm glad you think that because again, it was something a bit like the West Streeting thing. I was, I had been so used to him being one of the kind of industry people who erred on the side of being more supportive of this agenda and speaking out in favour of certain government regulations. And yet in the build up to party conference and over party conference, there was definitely a feeling that he was really trying to make the point of not the government not or discouraging the government to introduce against introducing those measures. So that's great if he was saying that, but I, I actually wonder if you are so attuned to the agenda that you're sort of taking 
taking you know the positives and actually overall it just sounds like industry not wanting government intervention at all so <laughs> I was sort of definitely focusing more on the like oh gosh this is someone who's either going back or <laughs> not being yeah helped. I mean that may be a fair challenge I mean I think there's also though we have seen it when we saw the original comments from Liz Trust before the party conferences around obesity rolling back on obesity measures I think we saw quite a lot of concern raised by some of the big retailers about flip-flopping on some of these things where they've invested huge amounts of money in reorganizing shops and so forth and to have all of this sort of what flip-flopping from one thing to another creates all this business uncertainty which in and of itself is a bigger problem than the regulation itself they just want to want to know what's actually supposed to be, they're supposed to be doing and then for specific to plan um which so yeah but anyway, that's a, it's, a, it's a good point. We should move on because time's rapidly running out. Um, let's move on to uh, the sort of free school meals. Now, this was for me was a highlight moment of concern. Well, actually, it's probably the highlight moment of both both party conferences. So with and I'll just recap for everybody what happened. So we had with Labour. Uh, Bridget Phillipson, the shadow uh, education secretary, announced Labour's support for free breakfasts for all primary school children um, to be included in their manifesto. Um, and they also had a kind of grassroots campaign which kind of bubbled up within the party, which led to a vote, which meant that free school meals for all primary school children and secondary school children would become Labour policy. Now, this sort of process is a little bit unclear to those of us that are not deeply embedded in the Labour Party, but, it, and it seems to me that something can be Labour policy, but could also be not something that's sort of actively supported by the Labour front bench. So it's not quite clear what that means for Labour's policy, but nevertheless, two quite significant developments. And then in the Conservatives, we had a fantastic event that we did with Onward, which hopefully Isabel will put the chat in. At, where there was just some brilliant interventions from head teacher Nick Capstick and others. And of course, Michael Gove, who came out with a really unequivocal statement of support for universal free school meals for everyone in the first instance, but recognizing that the first step had to be extension of free school meals to all children on universal credit. Of course, we're working on a huge campaign on that called Feed the Future. It's going to kick off next week. So, we're really, really thrilled to have his support. What's your take on all of this? Do you think um, how, let's talk, start with the Conservatives. Obviously, you know your way around the Conservative Party pretty well. Do you get a sense that this is something that is winnable in can campaign terms? Oh, you're frozen, Dolly. I'm not sure if that's me or you. Are you coming back? Shona, Isabel, is it frozen for everybody or just me? Yeah, okay, um, I think Dolly will hopefully come back in a second. <laughs> and meanwhile, I'll carry on talking. Um, so obviously, we've seen some important steps on free school meals. We are very, very hopeful that free school meals and extending eligibility to households on universal credit or children in households on universal credit will uh be a shift that we can see in the next few months dolly you froze um do you want to jump in on free school meals hopefully you're back yeah can you hear me okay yeah you're there Brilliant. sorry about that um yeah so i agree with you completely about the michael gove comments um being incredibly helpful and they show quite a drastic change um for him, he's definitely not been consistently someone who has spoken only supportively about this agenda. Um, but the way he was talking about it was fascinating. And starting with statements like, if our country is to succeed, we need to make sure we have a healthy population, you know, is a kind of amazing thing when the government is talking about, you know, a strong economy and growth and all of these things. And someone like him coming along and seeing a healthy population as the kind of foundation of a strong economy um, and essential for that was um, sort of uh, very, very positive. And I love the fact that he pointed to Sweden, which had a has a mixed school system, but said that every single child is given a school meal, a nutritious school meal, because it's as essential to learning as good teaching, pencils, paper, 
And I think the kind of framing around um, free school meals being called free is a really fascinating thing that a lot of conservatives in particular I've talked to find it quite hard to reconcile because it sounds as if it's a handout from mm. government. Whereas we don't treat other things that are given to children as an absolute part of their education as free. We don't call them free. Um, and I think it's really interesting if he can come and help move that frame along so that how, you know good food is seen as as much of a foundation and an essential for a child in school as anything else that they are provided uh, with it. So that was really heartwarming. Mm. I think it's sort of like you don't say you've got a free desk and chair when you're in school. You don't talk about the fact you've got free pencils. Um, yeah, <laughs> there was that really great quote where he said the Swedish would have looked at you bringing a pat lunch to school as if you were bringing in kind of wood and graphite to make your own pencil for school day. I mean, it was just it was a great quote. So definitely urge you to go and listen to that recording. Um, I mean, more broadly on the cost of living stuff, the situations. Um, bleak I, I mean from the current government in terms of both um well particularly I think the current row over just whether or not um benefits are increased in line with inflation or in line with wages um and yeah I mean given I mean we've been tracking food insecurity as you know we're going to be publishing our, our new round of data next week um the the numbers are staggeringly bad and um I just think it's sort of extraordinary that this is even a point of conversation but obviously there's a quite a large number of conservatives that are of that view as well I think I mean you picked up that a lot didn't you in in conversations yeah, I mean, it's such it's such a frustrating agenda if focusing particularly on food security and the provision of food for low income families, there's still such a gap between I'm going to particularly focus on politicians, but politicians um, understanding that food security by definition means access to nutritious food and not just any food. And so um, politicians already find it tricky to intervene on food and to kind of communicate about it in a way that doesn't sound like they're sort of telling people what to eat or whatever. That's already a difficulty, but that they feel they tend to feel more comfortable talking about food security and understanding that people, everyone needs access to food, but they very, very rarely make the explicit point that food security by definition means access to nutritious food. And so a lot of this agenda gets lost into that. So even when you're at the point of looking in a politician who's willing to lead and speak out on it, they won't quite get there when it comes to actually explaining that it's not just access to any food. Um, and actually, it can be really harmful embedding that idea that access to any food is good, you know, absolutely should be good food. And the soft drinks industry levy, the fact that the government is even thinking about um, scrapping it or, or moving away from it is just, for me, ludicrous because it actually increases the provision of uh, nutritious food to low income families at the time of a cost of living crisis. Um, and, and it just, again, shows that the understanding of how the policy works uh, is still very, very poor. But we know that from history. New governments tend to not understand how this agenda works. And we talked about this on the panel with Michael Gove and with Camilla Cavendish, Baroness Camilla Cavendish, who was the um, number 10 policy um, director of the policy unit under David Cameron. Um, and Henry Dimbleby talked very brilliantly about the fact that this agenda is largely misunderstood until someone actually sits down and looks at the data. And more often than not, in fact, I don't, I don't think I've ever met a public health minister to have come out of the Department of Health and not be completely committed to government intervention on this agenda. Once they've seen that data and they've had that responsibility and seen the reality, they tend to be committed for life. Mm, so I think we have to trust that Therese Coffey, um, as she goes on that journey, will uh, end up in the right place on this agenda and obviously do as much as we all can to give, uh, create the sort of political space and support that she'll need to have around her to, to actually take it forward. And as you say, to take on number 10 on it. <laughs> Let's briefly touch on the environment. We've only got a couple more minutes left. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, obviously there was the uh, little Greenpeace intervention into uh, Liz Truss's speech. Um, I think that was at the moment she was 
uh, talking about about fracking but agriculture i think has been looped in with a bunch of other things as a, a forthcoming supply side measures which are going to be discussed um around uh it, it, as a follow up to the the, the so called mini budget um and i think there's a early indicate i mean i think the, the the worrying signs around elms i think I mean, worrying signs also that were sort of teetering away on the edges of it, We even within the Labour Party, but obviously more significantly so within the Conservatives. Um, and I think we saw, we saw uh, Robert Goodwill at um, the Conservative Party conference talking about Al's not sufficiently rewarding upland areas and Minette Batters talking about concern that people were not participating enough in elms and it would result in a net reduction in subsidy for farmers. Um, and Labour being worried about the fact that it's not being implemented as well as it is and making commitments on that. Any, any further reflections from you on that sort of whole agenda? I mean, it links to this food security question, doesn't it? But at the national level, are we gonna have a big focus on uh, national, national, national food, food security? security at all costs to the extent of and the kind of growth agenda to the detriment of the environmental protections we're desperately trying to get introduced. I'm not sure if you can hear. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah, you're there. You're a bit frozen. Can you can you can you hear me? Sorry, my <laughs> I would say I would I would kind of wrap up by saying both these agendas are the kind of victim of an ideological clash um, with the current government. Um, so both sustainability and the health agenda is seen as adverse or in you know contradiction to the growth agenda, and um, and so there's going to be the same problem with both. And we've seen that with the threats to the kind of policy legacies that they've been handed over from the previous um, government. And uh, this comes back down. Oh dear, we're battling, battling signals. Um, I was hoping that Dolly would be able to give me her best under this overarching oh, problem, go. which is so, uh, Am I? Is that working? You're back. You're back. I'm gonna. We're gonna. We've got a couple more minutes. I would like to hear your best and worst moments. Best and moment. Best Go moment on. is definitely Michael Gove speaking so passionately in favour of this agenda. And the worst moment is to the realisation, I think, through my private conversations at conference with those very senior in government, um, that policy making is being done based on personal beliefs and anecdotal experiences and not taking the time to look at the evidence. And I'm just hoping, because I didn't talk to Therese Coffey about it personally, um, uh, that her approach, as Michael Gove said, is the one that ends up taking um, over and, and, and she really does follow through on the evidence and doesn't take what other people appear to be taking, which is uh, decisions based on their personal belief systems and ideological positions. So um, I would hope that that uh, evidence-based systematic approach to policy making um, takes over and we really do see this agenda continue as it should and needs to. That's a good note to end on. It leaves the onus on all of us, organisations I'm sure that are represented here on, on, on the uh, webinar, um, to go above and beyond in making that evidence crystal clear, palatable, presented in ways which speak to political priorities and, um, and make a compelling case. Um, so the work continues. Um, thanks, Dolly, for encouraging us all to get involved in party conferences. I think many of us felt that was a really worthwhile effort. And um, for those of you listening, hopefully this is the second in our series of quick bites, which, as you know, are intended to provide sort of snap reactions to things which are happening um, immediately after those happen to give people a chance to get a quick feel for the issues. Um, please do let us know if you'd enjoyed it or if you think it can be improved we'd love to hear from you and a big thank you to dolly and uh look forward to connecting with you all again soon thank you so much thank you bye